Okay, in the last video, we were just looking at how to actually calculate this area enclosed between these two graphs. We spent some time graphing it and figuring out where the bounds were, and then we used this uh, idea here that we can subtract the two graphs, and then away we went. We just started calculating it. So we took our time, we did the integral, well, we found the antiderivative, and now we've uh, evaluated it between those two points. Now it's just a simple matter of, well, not throwing up, but <laughs> just because this looks a little bit ugly. If you're averse to uh, fractions and exponents, maybe you don't like this and you start sort of sweating a little bit and worrying. But don't worry, well, let's just get through it slowly, slowly. So what we're going to do here is uh, keep in mind, this right here, this is not negative 1 and all that cubed. This is 1 cubed and then throw a negative in front of it. Same thing here, this over here is negative two cubed and then put a negative in front of it. That's what this tells us. So let's actually evaluate it. One cubed, that's one times one times one, that's just one. So then to put a negative in front of it, it makes it minus one over three. Great. One squared is just one. So this becomes minus one over two. Two times one is just two. So now I've evaluated, I've dealt with all of this is right here. That was easy. Over here, it's just a matter of being very, very careful. So I'm going to say minus, and I'm still going to put all this in a big bracket, a square bracket, just because I want to deal with this first before changing the sign. Or else I think maybe, um, at least for me personally, I usually make a mistake if I try to do it all in one. I often forget a little minus somewhere. And let's, let's not forget anything. I mean, let's try to get the exact answer here. So first of all, let's deal with this. Negative 2 cubed. This is a negative number raised to an odd exponent. What that means is that you're going to get a negative answer. And if you're not sure about that, just try this. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. Negative 8 times negative 1 is positive 8. So it's positive 8 over 3. Same over here. Negative 2 squared, that's just positive 4. And this tells me to put a negative in front of it, so negative 4 over 2. And then this right here, 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. All right. Now maybe I can actually um, put these together and actually try to do this. So I'll go a equals, so it's still negative 1 third minus 1 half, like I had before, plus 2. But now I want to actually sort of get rid of this square bracket and multiply this negative 1 through everywhere. So that means it'll be minus 8 over 3. This right here, minus, minus, will be plus. So it'll be plus 4 over 2. But 4 over 2 is just 2. So plus just regular old 2. Now we have minus, minus 4. That gives me plus 4. Awesome. Well, now I'd like to combine these. Maybe I can combine the uh, negative 1 over 3 and the negative 8 over 3. Those I can combine. So that gives me, well, negative 1 minus 8 gives me negative 9 over 3. And I have a 1 half just hanging out by itself. There's nothing to sort of play with here. It's uh, just hanging out on its own some. And uh, what we can do here then is we have... Um, well, we can just combine these terms now. We have a 2 and a 2 and a 4. So 2 plus 2 is 4. 4 plus 4 is 8. So I'll say plus 8. Awesome, I'm nearly there. The area, uh, let's see, 9 over 3, that's just regular old 3. 9 divided by 3 is 3. So that means it becomes negative 3 minus 1 half plus 8. Therefore, I can say that, well, 8 minus 3, that's just uh, 5. So 5 minus 1 half. And finally, what I need to do then is actually get these in a common denominator. So that means the area then will be, let's see, I need to make this something over 2. And 5 times 2 is 10, so that'll be 10. And if you're not sure, 10 divided by 2, is it really 5? Yep, so that works. So 10 over 2 minus 1 over 2. So finally, the area is equal to, well, 10 minus 1 is 9. So 9 over 2. This is the exact value for the area. You could also say, I suppose, that it's 4.5. That's also the same. But I like the fraction form here. So this is exactly 9 over 2. That is precisely this enclosed weirdo sort of uh, circular, not circular, but curvy area here. This is the exact value for this right here. It's 9 over 2. 
Now you might wonder why in the world didn't he do this on the calculator? Well, for starters, I wanted to show that you can totally do it by hand. Because remember, people were calculating stuff like this way before there were calculators. And also, I think it's just good habit to be able to deal with this stuff. Just you have to take your time though with the negatives. I think there's a big room for making a little mistake. That's why I just tried to be very methodical and take it slowly. Now I'd like to check though if my answer is correct with the calculator. My calculator can't actually deal with this area enclosed. And what my calculator can do, I mean, I can actually open it up here and I can, I can actually graph each of the graphs individually, like we talked about here, so negative x squared plus three. And I could also graph the other one, x plus one. Those were the two separate equations. So I can have it looking like this. And thankfully, that's how I sketched it. I could have used my calculator then to give me these bounds here if I was lazy and just wanted them and I would have gotten negative two and one here, you know, for these intersection points. That would have helped me here. But unfortunately, my calculator, at least this particular one, is not easily equipped for finding this area enclosed between the two curves. It turns out it sort of can, but I'm gonna show you a way to, to kind of trick it into doing it. So all you have to do is, well, it can't just directly, not easily at least, it can't just find the area enclosed between these two. But what you can do is instead of graphing those two graphs, let's actually clear this and clear this, and let's actually do a new graph. We're gonna a new graph of what it is to do this first one minus the second one. And the reason is that after we've sketched it, we know which one should come first. So in other words, we're going to have our calculator just deal with this here. So it's going to make a new graph that's gonna to look totally different than you know this and this. It may look completely different. Okay, so I'm gonna do the graph of f of x minus g of x. I only know I can do that because f of x is on top. Had they been reversed, I would have done g of x minus f of x. But in this case, I can do f of x, which is, again, it's negative x squared plus three, and the other one's gonna be x plus one. So what I'm gonna do then is put in brackets, negative x squared plus three, and then I'm going to subtract from that. So this is all gonna be in the same equation to graph, x plus one. See what I'm really doing, I'm having a graph f of x minus g of x all in one graph. Now it looks different. Do you notice it's just one parabola? If you notice it's shifted over to the left, so it is different than this one over here. It's not the same as that one because this one was made up of this one plus this line. But if I combine these two, f of x minus g of x, I get one single graph. Now sometimes your combined graph may look totally different from these. This happens to look very similar to f of x, except it's been moved over and maybe up or down, maybe it's been stretched. So let's maybe uh, zoom in. So zoom in, I'll just zoom in around the center. Yeah, that looks a lot nicer. So what I'm gonna do then is ask my calculator to do this integral from negative two to one. So I can do that under calc here. So calc, and I'm gonna choose number seven for the integral. And it's gonna ask me for the lower limit. I'm gonna say negative two. That better be this uh, place where it crosses the x-axis. It turns out it is. And this one right here, it better be one. Yep. And you notice it did, it shaded it, and it told me the answer is 4.5. Isn't that exactly what I had over here? So you see how it was 4.5, so that's really handy. So that means my calculator can actually deal with it. You just sort of have to trick it. You have to say, well, it can't find the area enclosed between them, but it can find the area underneath this composite graph. You know, this graph that's made up of f of x minus g of x, that new graph, it can find the area under that one. And I want to show you a little trick. Sometimes, you know, it gives you some really weird, crazy decimal going on, and you want to maybe convert that to a fraction or use it later. Rather than write it all down and then, you know, quit and then uh, start using it, watch this. If I just do quit, now I want to use that number 4.5, but let's say it was some complicated thing. I can still do this little blue ants. So second, and I press that one right there, and that remembers the last thing on my graph which is nice because then I could take that and if I want to convert it to a fraction, I can always press math, enter, enter. So math, because this first one converts it to a fraction. So that's why it's enter and then enter. Sure enough, it gives me nine over two. So that's just a little trick with your calculator that you can take something from your graph and actually use an answer from your graph, which was written over here. You can actually have it use it 
you know, in the sort of main calculator area here. So all this to show you that we can actually find the area between two curvy curves. I mean, these could have been totally weird curves. They could both be weirdo curves. Now, of course, the algebra looked a little bit ugly, but it's totally doable by hand. I think it's really powerful then that we can actually do this sort of thing. You might think, why in the world do I do this? You know, why do we need integrals in calculus? Well, this comes up a lot, like I said, in, uh, in a lot of different fields. Not only in economics, it's especially used a lot in physics. I just know that because I've got a physics background. But we use integrals and derivatives everywhere. It's very rare, in fact, to do anything without using integrals and derivatives. So calculus, at least for someone in physics, it's your best friend because it's a tool. It helps you to solve all sorts of insane looking problems with a really neat little sort of flourish. You're like, ta-da, and then there you go, f of x minus g of x, and then whoosh, you get the answer. I think it's really cool because you can actually use that to solve really crazy things like uh, how fast will you be going in a rocket? What will your acceleration be? You might say, oh, that's easy. It's just a constant acceleration, but it's not because a rocket, you know, it's always losing mass. So that means its acceleration changes every second. So we can write a calculus type equation for, you know, the acceleration. And furthermore, the air resistance, you know, in the air, that changes as you go up higher. So again, that might seem totally complicated, but using these tools of integration and derivatives, in fact, you can do equations that have combos. Those are actually called differential equations. And as long as you just write one of those, you can then solve really insane looking things quite easily. And that's how, you know, you can actually get a rocket really into space by using these tools here. So these tools aren't just, you know, to make your life painful in class. They actually do lots of real things.